we're going to get started. We have a great lineup this evening. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Sarah L. Hodge. I'm part of Europe Must Act. I'm going to moderate the panel this evening. I'm going to do some short introductions and then um, we'll get straight into the questions. I also wanted to let you know that if you're on Zoom with us tonight, the chat is a safe space. So we will be moderating for hate speech. And also, if you have direct questions, please submit them into the question and answer section. And if we have time, we will answer your questions. We're, we're also going to be sending a follow up email tomorrow to everyone who is tuned in. This is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it back as well. So as I said, my name is Sarah Elhaj. I'm a refugee support worker based in London, and I'm Europe Must Act's UK chapter focal point. Europe Must Act, for those that don't know, is a grassroots movement which was started by volunteers on the Aegean Islands back in March 2020. We now have chapters all over Europe, and we continue to campaign for fair and humane migration policies across the UK and Europe at a local and international scale. We're all volunteers, and we all have the same goal of advocating for people on the move. I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Parwana Amiri, who is an activist and poet. Parwana is an author, poet, and activist from Afghanistan. In September 2019, she and part of her family reached Moria refugee camp on Lesbos, Greece. She has now reached Germany. Her latest book of poetry, We Will Fly Higher, is created from her experiences and insights, shedding a light on the harsh realities faced by people on the move. I just want to check as well. Christian, are you hearing me okay? Cool. Felix Thompson from Calais Appeal is our second panelist. Felix is the communications and advocacy officer at Calais Appeal, which is a coalition of seven grassroots organizations working with displaced people across Northern France. Previously, he worked at Code Your Future, a free coding school for refugees in disadvantaged communities and coordinated humanitarian aid efforts at Refugee Aid Serbia. Alina Liapina sadly couldn't join us this evening. Um, she is the founder of From the Sea to the City campaign. We will include some information about From the Sea to, our, From the sea to the City in our follow-up email tomorrow. And uh, Europe Must Act is a member of From the Sea to the City, which is a great campaign. James Wilson from Detention Action. James is director of Detention Action. He joined the charity as its deputy director in 2019. He has worked in the refugee sector in the UK for 17 years, including 10 years at British Red Cross, primarily working directly with people in the asylum and detention systems. Detention Action provides emotional and practical support to hundreds of people held in immigration detention in the UK every year and campaigns for the end to indefinite detention and fundamental reform of the UK's detention, deportation, and asylum systems. In 2022, Detention Action was one of the lead claimants in the challenge to the UK Rwanda Removals Plan, which Europe Must Act supported. Legal action, I meant we supported Detention Action, not the Rwanda Plan. <laughs> Legal action, which has so prevented anyone being removed to, Rwa to Rwanda under the scheme. Detention Action coordinates two lived experience campaigning networks, Allies for Justice and Families for Justice. And Christian Schmidt, who is also with Europe Must Act. Christian is an activist and Europe Must Act's advocacy and network coordinator. After volunteering in one of the camps on the Aegean Islands, Christian joined Europe Must Act in May 2020 and is the co-founder of the Europe Must Act chapter, chapter in Germany. As an activist and volunteer, Christian gained a broad knowledge about the policies and situation of refugees and asylum seekers in camps and detention centers in Europe and Germany over the years. He has worked with refugees and campaigned at different points in their journey from the points people enter Europe on the Aegean Islands through to the regional reception centers in Germany, and finally to their own homes. He also is involved in campaigns against detention pending deportation in Germany. So we have an amazing panel this evening. I'm going to hand over to Parwana because we'd like to start this webinar with one of Parwana's poems from her latest book of poetry, We Will Fly Higher. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this great introduction. And hi, everyone. Hi to our um, listeners and participants of our today's webinar. I'm really glad to be in this discussions and also very happy to have this potential insightful also questions as well. Uh, for the beginning, I would like to read one of the one of my poems, 
which I wrote uh, through the demonstrations that we organized. I would like to also say that I am the campaigner of the campaign that's called Building Schools Not Walls. That's a hashtag that I run in 2021. It was especially when we didn't have the right to education and there were uh, walls around the camp that was getting uh, you know, built. So that was the main reason that we, I started this campaign uh, because uh, I wanted the uh, system to know that there are 650 students that are lacking education, the time that they were building uh, the walls around the camp. The name of the poem is This Never Ending Struggle. From east to west, from north to south, I call you. I call you to the world of war where peace was the bright but died. I call you to our struggles where peace was, where girls are on the front line. I call you to our protests without a microphone, with one voice, I call you. Behind these walls meet our Spartan fights. I call you to the world of burning hearts where feasts are raised and sails are hot. I call you, I urge you, come with us, join in our struggles. We demand our rights, so threatened and afraid, but still, we resist. We will not stop and will not be stopped. We are soldiers without armor. Our armor is our posters. We fight without swords. Our swords are our slogans. Loud and clear. We are an army with no horse. Our legs are enough. Our will is tough. We resist and will never stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Parwana. We'll be sending information on Parwana's book to our participants in our follow-up email tomorrow. So now we're gonna get into the questions. Our first question is about bursting the bubble. And I'm gonna go to James at Detention Action first. What innovative ways can we use to burst the bubble in issues of migration? So for example, reaching out to detention, detention center staff or conservative politicians, how do we get more people in the conversation? Thank you very much, Sarah, and hi, everyone. Um, um, really thrilled to be speaking with everyone. And thank you very much to Pawana for that wonderful poem. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that with everyone. Um, yeah, so it's a, an excellent first question in terms of bursting the bubble. Um, I would say, and I, I realise this risks starting the session on what might sound like a wildly optimistic note, but I actually think to some extent, um, and certainly when it comes to public, if we're talking about public opinion, and certainly if we're talking about the UK, I couldn't speak to, with any real knowledge to public opinion in the rest of Europe, in the UK, um, to some extent we have already done this. Um, so there was recent coverage in The Guardian of the fact that, and I've heard this it, uh, previously and from other sources, that actually, if you look at the polls, look below the, you know, the, the government rhetoric and the media spin often and the media focus on what the supposed public opinion is on, on migration in the UK. Actually, in the UK, we've seen a, a shift in terms of much increased, greatly increased positivity towards migration over the last 10 years. Um, which is frankly quite something in the country that brought you such such developments as, as Brexit. Um, but we've seen a very dramatic shift. And actually, I saw heard somebody say in a recent meeting with some, some, some authority, although this would sound like a difficult thing to prove, that this is an unprecedented shift in any, any developed country in recent times. Um, it's, a, it's been a dramatic shift. So I think we need to remember there are th that actually there's already been quite a lot of ground one and can be can be ground one in terms of public opinion. And we know we have really strong arguments. We know that refugees are people in desperate need of support. We also know that migration happened, that most of us, and if not us, our, our ancestors will have migrated at some point for a variety of reasons. Migration is inevitable. It's going to increase in the 21st century. And it would increase, frankly, even if all the war and oppressive regimes stop tomorrow because of climate change, it's only going to increase in the coming decades. Um, and if we were to start looking at different forms of migration, even if um, we were to, one was to conclude in theory um, that certain types of migrations were less, um, less positive for countries than others, even though it's not a position I would take, that it's actually people seeking uh, 
seeking safety from persecution, who should be the most protected. They should be the last, the last group we would ever want to shut out. Um, we have really strong arguments and, and we need to believe in those and, and use those. Um, speaking briefly on a more sort of granular level in terms of potentially um, conservative politicians, as you suggested in the question, this is something we thought a lot about detention action. Um, so I think having said we need to have a, a big vision and be, be confident and speak positively in terms of migration, we also uh, need to think in, about particular conversations and particular audiences, and there are ways of reaching lots of different audiences in a way that's consistent but that also nuances it. So, for example, when it comes to detention in the UK, um, yes, there's very strong uh, humanitarian arguments and human rights arguments for why the current system is completely wrong and hugely damaging. Um, but we can also speak to politicians in the centre on the right in terms of in terms of cost and efficiency, because the system actually fails no matter what direction you look at it. Even, even if you come from quite a right wing position on migration, the detention system just makes no sense whatsoever. So we need to do some careful tailoring of our messaging, but that it always remains rooted in, in human rights and core beliefs about migration. Thank you, James. And also, I wanted to compliment you on starting on an optimistic note, because I think in the sector, there's a lot of negativity. And I wanted to um, ask Christian if he could speak a little bit about Europe Must Act's hope-based communication, because that reminded me when you started on the positive note about um, a strategy we've been using this year. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sarah, of course. Um... Yeah, it's it's interesting what you said, James, and and uh, this concept of hope-based communications um, that is a, a framework or a concept which we follow or try to follow uh, for almost a year now. It was founded by by other people um, who were working in communications, and yeah, it's um, we always uh, have to say in the beginning this hope. The word hope is maybe not the best word to use. It's not this naive naive uh, way of of thinking of everything will be fine one day. It's more um, the idea of, of painting the picture, um, how we envision the future. And um, we as Europe must act, of course, we, we, we don't want to say that we know how, how, it's, uh, how it should be, how our activism should be in the future. But we've, we see um, that if we apply this idea of painting the picture, um, how we envision the future, that more people, especially outside of the bubble, are likely to, to follow us and, and listen to us. Um, I mean, we all, a lot of us here probably know how appalling and, and horrible the situation in the borders and in the in the seas um, is right now for people. Um, so this is nothing, this is not stories that we can tell and people say, oh, that sounds interesting. I would like to join you. I think we more or less reached a point where people say we switch off. Um, and this is very interesting. We, we started this last year. Um, we are far away from being professional with this. Um, but it's interesting, especially for me as a network coordinator, I travel a lot, I talk to a lot of groups and people, and I hear that people are interested in this. And um, yeah, this is, is one thing, it's it's definitely uh, not the solution, but definitely one thing we should, uh, we as activists should look into in the future. Thank you, Christian. And before we move on to the next question, Felix or Parwana, do you have anything you'd like to add? Should I go to the next question? Cool. So our next question is about making connections. So first I'm gonna to go to Felix. Why isn't there a link between on the ground NGOs and EU level NGO slash politicians? Um, how can we organize on the ground work to connect with policymakers? Cool. Um, hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Can I get one? From, yeah, nice. Um, yeah, thanks very much for the invite. It's great to be here and share the panel with uh, such interesting people. I'll try and continue the optimism. Uh, we'll see how far we can go. Um, but yeah, on the question of making connections, why isn't there a link between on the ground, frontline organisations and politicians? Um, it's difficult to say, and, and, and Calais is a context, Northern France is a context I know best. I can't speak for generalisations of border zones. Um, I think that organizations can maybe be divided into organizations which are firefighting and know that they're firefighting, organizations which are firefighting and kind of realize they're firefighting, but also think they have time to do other things, 
um, and then organizations which have the luxury of being meteorologists and looking at the root causes of fire and thinking, oh, what's going on here and what can we do that's a bit more sustained? Um, and I think that confusion of definition can, can be very easy and can be very exhausting for organizations. So often frontline organizations who are doing, how if they want to term it, humanitarian or emergency response, think that they also have the capacity to do advocacy work. Um, and they may well have information that's useful for advocacy, but they may be overstretched. Um, and so I, I guess I would just frame the question to say everybody has access to talk about their work in a way that's interesting for people, but you have to be very realistic about your capacity and the best way to navigate that confusing system. Um, I, yeah, I guess to give an example of Calais Appeal quickly, Calais Appeal is a coalition with seven different grassroots organizations, um, many of whom have been in Northern France for a long time, who do excellent work on the spectrum of humanitarian to sometimes you'd call it advocacy work. As a coalition, we have not been around a long time. Uh, we are not heavily resourced and we don't have extensive contacts with politicians uh, in the UK. Um, the way that we see ourselves is really as a Somebody gave me a football analogy the other day. I don't watch football, but hopefully it translates. But we see ourselves as a, a feeder club to bigger clubs, bigger organizations. So we have access to really important information of what's going on in northern France, like the number of evictions, the violence which is being used in the evictions, people's access to water, food, and human rights violations which are going on. But we don't have the contacts to put that in front of policymakers. But what we can do is we can get that into the hands of organizations who can do that work, who already have those contacts, who are already having those conversations. Um, so yeah, so just to bring it back to how the question is phrased, I think a lot of organizations are busy. I think they're, they're firefighting and they think that they can do more. And the way to start making those steps that certainly we're trying to do is to join coalitions, uh, places like Together for, Ref for Refugees, Cross Border Forum, Europe must act, other platforms like that, that you can meet other actors who may well want to hear about what you're doing and have access to the data that you have uh, that will be useful for their advocacy work. Um, so I think it's a bit of a cliche in this sector, but making connections, building bridges, building coalitions, being part of them is probably the best way to say you may not be in touch with policymakers now, but you can at least get into that channel of communications. Um, that was the way I, I understood the question, but I'm sure there's lots more to say. Thank you, Felix. And also, I think I think you're totally right. I think in any sector, I think bodies, different bodies need to work together. And what what's great about Europe Must Act is that we have chapters in all of these different cities where we can compare and contrast asylum policy. And we're trying to work with more organizations as well. So I think that's really important. And Parwana. I'd like to ask you, in terms of connecting people on the ground with policymakers, what role do people on the move play in this debate and how can this role increase? I think that's a very good question, but it's also a very uh, right question. I mean, they're not, I cannot find a specific answer for that. But I can definitely add some, you know, some points that maybe it would be clear for you and audiences to have a clear answer for themselves but I think people need to elaborate it themselves because it is not the same in all the countries especially like it's not the same in margin of Europe than the center of Europe it's not the same in UK or in Italy you know it is all different but I can totally say that uh, the first point is that how easy is access to information for the people underground you know the first time that they come they don't have access to information they don't know where to refer to they don't know whom to trust to and also they are afraid of talking about the condition for sure um so i think making a very safe space for refugees to just to express themselves to talk about the condition would be a good solution because in the first you know step we want to make this connection stronger among people who are in trust and also people that they can trust to. Uh, the second step can be on um, how to give the voice to themselves. I have seen that refugees and displaced people have been represented in many ways. I think this needs to be stopped. At least this needs to be stopped uh, uh, by the NGOs, organizations, and also initiatives that they are advocating the right of refugees. This means that 
in any bird, in any you know discussion or conversation that there's an issue about refugees, there need to be at least one refugee present that, there. You know, this needs to be happen. I think this is the time, and they already. Uh, I think they have uh, um, approved enough that they can share their ways, uh, particularly if they are uh, they experienced it and they uh, passed, uh, you know, the, the, the journey. And the second one is how can, you know, unaccompanied minors uh, that they are uh, on their journey be able to, you know, talk about or uh, talk about condition or, uh, or I can say to express the situation without being afraid of getting detained. This, this has been really limited for unaccompanied minors. The fourth one is how can legal information and legal support be given to, to, to refugees that they are specifically in the detention centers? And this means that they shouldn't need to be present in the office or wherever it is, but uh, they should be able to do it even online or on, out and on, learn it as well. And uh, the fourth question is, is it really necessary for the information to be in the original language of them in order for them to be uh, easier to understand? Or this need to be kept originally as, as in, in, in English? I don't know how, uh, I mean, how close am I to the question that you asked? I hope that I didn't go really, uh, you know, far away of the question. But I want to say that, that, you know, being an activist myself, and I can say that I was the first activist in the margins of Europe in the biggest refugee camp, at least the first uh, female activist. And I saw that there's a lot of interest of young people that they want to be in this route and they want to start themselves. But they are lacking the support, the legal support, especially because they don't know what will happen if they will be get detained by the police if they go to the street and they they demonstrate. They don't know what would happen to their asylum apply if they would get detained because of talking about the condition and circumstances, or you know providing the proofs. And also, they don't have this connection with the Soldarian people, with local people. Um, and uh, this comes again on lacking support and also hearing so lots of uh, rumors and lots of information and also that some of them are really approved that it's really easy for the uh, for countries that they are there are not so much mentorship on their legal system uh, to detain their refugees or to question them or to uh, make anything that they want to the asylum apply. So for refugees to become activists, their first shelter, I mean, the first thing that they, that, you know, strike them is their asylum apply, which should be a safe space for them to talk as well as well where the, wherever they are leaving. Yeah. So I think there could be also other points and also, also other solutions that can come from our revenue. But I think these are coming from my experience. And I think the things that I have, elaborate it. Um, I mean, having the experience myself. I think that's great, especially I wanted to ask you as well, because I think some asylum seekers, when they're in either a camp or detention center, they're, they want to, as you said, become activists, but they're worried about where they might end up, but also worried about what might happen to family back home if they're from a place like Syria or Afghanistan. Um, so having to be careful with your name and and the way you present information. Have you noticed that in in the camps as well? Uh, for me, it was a risk to be honest because I got some kind of sacred message from the authorities in the camp that I need to be careful about my actions, that otherwise I would risk my asylum apply. That it is safer for me to not be so loud and so critical against the system. It was really clear and it was totally and uh, completely uh, against my activism and against my work. But I had this uh, chain of uh, people that they were um, always connected with me and they were always, uh, uh, you know, giving me 
the alternative, uh, the strategy and the solution that uh, no matter how, you know, how strict I go ahead, but there are such kind of a legal support behind me. So this really made me to feel revealed and to go on and to continue and to even make it stronger. And also by taking more people and, you know, holding more hands and also trying to engage more young people to be in my side, uh, this became much difficult for the authorities to stand against us and to stop us. Yes, thank you. I think as well, um, so it sounds like NGOs on the ground and grassroots organizations on the ground, if the more they help with legal advice and protection of refugees in the camps, the better because bigger bodies like the UNHCR are overstretched, it sounds like, especially in Moria camp. Is that is that correct, Parwana? Yes, I mean, I can, I don't dare to really talk about Moria camp because in Moria camp, when they are lacking legal support from the authorities and how is it to be, uh, you know, to be an activist. And even those that they were taking photos, they were going under the question of the authorities. And in some cases they were breaking the, you know the the telephones the phones of the people taking photos they were investigating about those that they were sharing those photos or any kind of proofs about the condition it was happening in 2022 and in 2021 thank so, you for, yeah no i just want to say thank you for for stating that because i think more people need to know what's actually happening inside the camps and um James, Felix, or Christian, do you have anything to add about making connections? So, sorry, James, go ahead. Sorry, um, thanks, Sarah. Just a really quick point, although this might stray into the slightly into the next question. Um, but this is, I mean, we're not primarily a grassroots organization, but just thinking about reaching politicians, whether that's national politicians or, or indeed, you know, Europe-wide politicians. I think Felix makes really important points about thinking about different, you know, what kind of organisation we are. There's lots of small organisations and it's important for, any, for every organisation to realise it can't do everything and, you know, to think about the role that it plays. But I think in terms of reaching politicians, we all we need to go through a process firstly of thinking really carefully about who we're trying to reach and if a conversation is actually possible with them. There are some politicians out there that we're just never going to persuade and it's all, you know, frankly, uh, not to undercut my own optimism too much, but it's simply a waste of time trying to engage with on who actually there is, there is a conversation to be had. And then secondly, while we're talking about the latter group, about conversations where there is a prospect of conversation. So, for example, in the UK at the moment, right now, I wouldn't make predictions, but it's looking fairly likely there will be a, you know, a, a centre-left government or coalition after the next election um and we can look look forward to that and that that's going to be a, a a government uh that we are likely to be able to have more conversations with than the current one that's from a low bar but there is more prospects of positive engagement but we do need to recognize that collectively and individually that's not going to be quick and easy to do it requires huge amounts of capacity every now and again you get a moment in, in campaigning where a moment or an event or an image has a huge seismic shift, but most of the time it's hard going. It's one difficult conversation after another of, you know, in this case, persuading politicians why migration should be one of their big priorities and then the kind of changes that we want to see. There's no, there's unlikely to be a quick solution to that. So we have to collectively think about how we have the capacity for really careful relationship building and, and work. Thank you. And Christian? Um, yeah, I wanted to to make two points. One very uh, one very quick point, um, adding to what uh, you said, Pavana, that um, also especially the the closed camps, uh, especially in Greece, um, yeah, intensify and, and and make this problem even bigger um, because it's on one hand people cannot leave these closed camps and cannot talk to other people, to journalists, uh, to politicians, and on the other hand it makes NGOs leave because they don't have access to 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 beneficiaries, so they leave Samos, Lesbos, so there's less NGOs and people cannot leave the camps. So uh, just uh, to keep this in mind that this is um, a strategy by leaders, by 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 uh, European countries um, across Europe. Um, and another thing uh, more on the other hand of, of uh, on the other end um, is that that is something we see because Europe must act is actually trying to fill this gap between gr groups on the ground and 
and uh, policymakers uh, in Brussels, for example, if we speak about the European Union. And um, we were looking into this a bit more detailed in the last month. And what we feel and hear is that there is also a complete different understanding of activism. So there is NG there are NGOs, for example, in Brussels. Um, that exactly know who exactly know how to influence policy making, but they have a complete different kind of thinking uh, because, of course, they know they they get involved with the people who, in the end, write the policies. And that's a complete different mindset than, for example, uh, Felix, uh, the groups in in Calais who who struggle with evictions every two days and or not not themselves, but with uh, providing support for people who get evicted every two days. And this is where we, as Europe, must act. Think um, that we need to really try to fill or, or, or build this bridge um, that Felix uh, was already mentioning with regards to just what Felix said, connecting people, getting to know each other, but also with regards to language. Like when someone who is on the ground says something, um, how do they have to say it so that someone in Brussels actually understands what they mean, what they talk about and in which form, like does it, do they need a database, do very concrete questions, a database, a testimony, what really helps policymakers in, in, in Brussels, for example, or also in capital cities uh, across Europe? Thank you. And before we move on to the next question, does anyone have anything else to add? I would add something really um, briefly, if it's possible. Um, I think I wanted to also add something about the NGOs. Um, I noticed that uh, people on the ground, they really, they are, uh, they're losing their trust on NGOs. Because in many cases, especially those that they were doing activism, they were asking for uh, for support, or they were asking for sharing of information or talking about the situation, but the NGOs were denying that. And of course, it's not something that NGOs want to do that, but something that uh, authorities are limiting them. And from the state, there are specific limitations for, for NGOs that they are working, uh, specifically on the closed camps or in margins of Europe or, or in the center of Europe, but in the detention centers. So they are limited. And But in any, you know, in a way, they need to also talk about this limitation. This need to also be like NGOs need to be advocated, I can easily say. Because if they cannot go, uh, you know, beyond the limitation that they have, then the place that they are acting, it seems that they are supporting the situation. Because they cannot talk about the truth, they cannot bring the reality, but they need to continue their actions. But what does it mean to act in a detention center when you are not able to advocate it? Thank you. I agree. And um, I'm just going to answer one of the questions we've been asked by. Chris from Brittany, who asked um, what kind of local initiatives can people do in their own areas? And I would suggest, I don't know about every everywhere in Europe, but if you have in the UK, for example, I would go to your local council and ask about local initiatives for integrating refugees, wh whether that be community language classes or what kind of initiatives your council has in place. And if they don't have anything in place, that's a great chance to, to bring that to that community. And it differs from all over the UK. West London is very active in refugee integration. Um, same with Islington, um, but it's different in each borough and boroughs are definitely lacking. And I think um, in different European cities, go to your local council or the equivalent and see what they're doing. And if they're not doing anything, that's a great space to get involved. So thank you for that question. And so our next question is about presenting evidence, which James touched on a little bit. I'm gonna to go to Felix first. So many politicians tell us that harsher borders and policies reduce migration. What evidence should grassroots organizations give to policymakers to refute this? Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and we've already covered quite a lot of ground on it. Um, so I'll try not to repeat myself. Uh, I also won't lecture you about why deterrence don't work. I don't understand that to have been the question to give a case study of why what we know in Northern France, we're seeing deterrence not work. So I'm not thinking about specific evidence. Um, I, yeah, I am going to repeat some things. I, I think no, Christine, go ahead. is that right? Sorry, <laughs> yes, some messages ahead. need to need to be repeated. Yes. <laughs> Um, I think what Christian said about that this kind of role of interpreting 
evidence and data and and basically using the right arguments and the right ways to the right audiences is basically the name of the game uh, different people have different positions on that there will be red lines that some people don't want to make in terms of arguments as Shane said there's difficult language to use about uh, these notions of deserving or undeserving and their conversations that people who set the, the kind of media tone are able to do and, and we have to decide how we want to engage with those um, but I think that role of interpreting data and getting it into the right hands is is really really important um, so again it just goes back to I think my, my earlier point about really understanding your organization or, or, or your individual activities or the groups that you're involved in in whatever form you're doing activism and just knowing like who are we what do we do what's our mission statement why are we unique what are the things that we can leverage like what is the unique access we have or the data that we have and how are we going to get that out to people um again like christian said uh, groups that I work with who are firefighting maybe don't think about databases maybe they don't think about how they collect testimonies maybe they don't uh, understand themselves at that time but but uh, I see more and more of that work happening with the assistance of groups that you're at mass act um, I guess just to question the question a little bit like it says what evidence should we give to policymakers that's part of the thing the other part is again changing public opinion and just discourse because they do respond to discourse so you can also set the tone that way um how to navigate the messy messy world of communications and press i think is really important particularly for smaller groups that, that i work with um there can be a fear as, as parwana was saying for many reasons about speaking to media about how you get your, your voice out there about who is uh, able to do that what, what are the risks for different groups of doing that but it's really, really important to do it. Whatever work you're doing, I think you should dedicate a certain amount of time to getting the message out about, about the really essential work you're doing. Um, and a lot of that is press training. A lot of what I do is press training. It's just convincing people like you do really important work. You need to tell people about it. And if you're not involved in the conversation, somebody else is deciding the conversation for you. So I think press train, press train, press train. It's really like... It's kind of a game how people talk to the media and do comms and get their messages out there. Parwana said it amazingly. Swords are our slogans, but we need to have slogans. Like James said, the arguments are there, but we need to know how to use them. And that doesn't come naturally to people. So get informed about how to do that. Sorry if this sounds a bit <laughs> authoritative, no, but that would be my advice. Um, and then the last thing about that quickly, um, again, is interpreting evidence to different audiences, but basically human human stories sell i mean that sounds a little bit stories simple. over statistics yeah there you go that's the way to put it um journalists and even politicians and most people are not convinced by databases alone they are really essential to people who need them but they also need to understand the impacts that policies are having on people uh, anyone who's worked with press and border zones will know that journalists come and that they don't care what organizations are doing they don't care how many meals they put out they don't care about evictions until you can introduce them to somebody who can explain what it's like to be evicted what it's like to not have enough water to shower every week that is what's happening to people and if we communicate it in ways that are not playing the game of, of media then you're doing a disservice basically because you're speaking into an empty crowd again that sounds a bit harsh but but sometimes I think it's it. true. I think I think as well, especially in the media, um, which is why we've been focusing on hope based communication. Um, everything has kind of a negative edge, so it's important to tell tell stories that people are actually going to be listening to and not just tune out. And I think um, what, like I said, stories over statistics. One thing I will say, though, I agree with you, Felix, about. Um, kind of people power in general and, you know, galvanizing um, groups of people. And I, I tell the same story, but I'm, I'm half Syrian and um, very moved by the Arab Spring and Syrian refugees. And um, the Syrian resettlement scheme in the UK was largely put in place due to public protest when Alan Kurdi's photo came out. And crowds came out and really protested what was happening and, you know, um, wanting to help refugees and the Syrian scheme was put in place and it had its flaws, but it was put in place largely due to public protest. And I think people need to come together more to protest 
you know, the rights of asylum seekers because it's not just Syrian people and things are still happening. And there's so many things we should be protesting and it needs more voices. That's my little interjection. <laughs> and um, James, this is a question kind of specific to the UK. Do you think going against the refugee convention in the illegal migration bill will have a knock-on effect in other countries due to illegal laws in um, in the UK and, and some EU member states? Thanks, Sarah. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, I think it, it, it could potentially, I, I mean, the, the short answer would be, I, I hope not um, in, in terms of having, a, you know, encouraging other states potentially to, to follow on a similar tra trajectory, but I fear that that's, that's, that's certainly a real risk. I think it's very tied to, we're seeing, you know, the Refugee Convention, the current illegal migration bill in the UK, you know, going directly against threatening, threatening to unpick um, the, the the international system or at least the UK's obligations to the international refugee situation and that's you know coming a year after the Rwanda the Rwanda scheme was announced which very much uh, does the same thing it's very encouraging that so far the legal action that we were initially part of has you know so far no one has been removed to Rwanda um, under the scheme but it still goes through the courts the battle goes on and, and, and unfortunately there's the risk that even if Rwanda as a scheme never happens that another you know, another partnership sign with another, you know, another third country or, or territory. Um, so yes, I think that there is a risk and we've seen sort of, uh, you know, there's been talk in, I think, of, of Denmark and Germany, other other countries potentially looking at looking at similar offshoring, however it's phrased, um, schemes. So I think that's, that's a very live risk and that heightens the, you know, that should focus us even more. I don't think the sector in the UK needs, you know, I think we're, we're pretty focused, um, but it's another reason why we need to fight these terrible policies and the current the awful legislation that's currently going through and, and we'll be, you know, we'll be facing the implementation likely in the next few months while we have to fight it. It's not just about the, the situation in the UK, it's about the potential example to, to other, other states across Europe and beyond potentially. Um, I again remain optimistic that actually that that both that the UK government um, doesn't know what it's doing in terms of these these moves. That it's primarily about campaigning than anything that is that is plausible, which doesn't make the policies less terrible. Um, as Felix not, said, the narrative and the media you completely. Know, and it's about it's about slogans. It's about winning winning votes more than anything else rather than something practical. And I also think, think and hope that the commitment to the Refugee Convention and other international law norms remains stronger than it seems right now in the UK, but it's de definitely a battle we should take very seriously. Thank you, James. And before we discuss resilience after presenting evidence, um, does anyone have anything else to add to presenting evidence? Christian? Yeah, um, maybe to, to add uh, a few points to what James just said about the UK. Um, I mean, what we, what we see in, in Europe is that um, some specific countries try to push the red line far, far, far uh, away, like Hungary, for example, Lithuania with uh, the legislation where they allow pushbacks. Um, and and this um, is, is a, like a, a big, big diversity of things that countries do. So in, in general, uh, the I think the, the the topic that there is illegal laws in place um, that appeared not uh, not a long time ago. I think the much bigger problem is that countries just not um, follow the laws that are in place already, and the the result of this is just like okay, we train this for a while and we show you that we can just do it. No one cares. The EU doesn't care. The wider public doesn't care. So we push push the red line to the point where we put this in domestic law, and then they say no. But in in Lithuania, this is we we decided on this. This is this is not illegal, and then the EU has to come uh, with their infringement procedure and tell Lithuania this is wrong or Hungary, and then Hungary says yeah we don't care, and they tell them please pay money or or you have to pay a fine, and they say we don't pay. And and this is the dynamic so i i don't know if maybe maybe people here don't not agree but i think it's not the biggest problem that it's illegal law the problem is the way to that we we all look at this and we all see what's going what's happening and um to be honest in this point i'm a bit yeah i don't know demotivated or maybe that's not the right word but it's like we we see what is happening and then we 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 have to write press releases about lithuania where they all vote on yeah let's make pushbacks illegal 
and they follow the, the idea of Hungary to have volunteers in, in the borders to push back people or, or to monitor the, 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 the borders. So I think that's a very important point to say that the illegal laws is the result. What we have to look at is, is countries like Greece, especially um, countries in the Balkans um, that do everything which is against uh, existing law. And this is actually where we have to start because if we only focus on the illegal law, they reached their goal because then they pushed our ideas and our narratives to their point. And I think we have to, we have to stay stable and say, no, 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 we stay with the existing law and we want you to follow the existing law. Yes, and the trouble with law is there's no accountability. <laughs> Um, and that feeds into a question we have from someone in the audience. Um, with rise of hate speech online and far right parties, um, what can civilians do and how can we advocate online? And I think that's a really good question. And I think um, my, this is just my personal opinion, but kind of feeding on from what Christian said, I think we just need more voices. We need more voices on the other side. And I was at um, a webinar discussing the rise of um, far right um, protest, but not they're not protesting. They're well terrorizing. I don't know. <laughs> um, there have been a few incidents in the UK recently with far right protesters um, on um, uh, in hotels where migrants have been. And what what we learned was that they're not actually protesting against migrants themselves or refugee rights. They're just being pro far right. So they're not against, you know, they don't understand migration law, but they're just being pro far right. And the more people on, you know, shouting against them, the more, you know, I think we just need to be louder. And also, um, for example, in Glasgow, when people, I'm sure people in the chat know about a family that was going to be deported and their neighbors came out and basically said no and protested against that. I think we just need more, more coalition of people on the other side. That's what I think. And Parwana, please go ahead. I just wanted to, I think it's very specific and very um, good point. Uh, I wanted to share my personal experiences in this field. I experienced the same, you know, race of hatred in uh, social media in Twitter because when I was active in Twitter I didn't have any experience I didn't have any mentorship and I didn't uh, have any anyone to get to just get ideas and I was just talking about condition I was thinking that social media is a safe place for me at least to do something but later on I noticed that there are people that I didn't know and they were honestly attacking me uh, by the chat you know they were just uh, sharing so much hatred, uh, not only by retweeting or by making uh, you know screenshots of my uh, uh, my tweets and just re you know retweeting that and uh, with lots of hatred uh, or you know starting having campaigns like hashtags hashtag you know, uh, deport Pawana or something. It was a lot and really a lot. And later on, I noticed that for a group of women that they were, you know, talking about feminists, they had the same experience. But after that, they noticed with a council of other women to make like a robot you know it was automatically mm, supporting them when there was something like this happening it was uh, other people were getting alerted to support that person you know and they were just uh, starting just supporting and supporting you know uh, showing in social media so much support and so on and this helped uh, a lot and they were not uh, later on really able to just uh, uh, share their opinions the way that they want it. So I think the same thing, especially refugees want themselves. Because if someone like a refugee would be attacked in social media and be afraid to share it with other people or legal centers and so on, then this would not be a good uh, beginning for them to start, you know, uh, and to have this courage to continue. Um, so I think this needs to be taken account and uh, this needs to be, I think technically there is a solution for that, but I don't have it. We need to ask others about their experiences. Shortly, I just wanted to also add that I'm running out of battery. I was in the demonstration. I'm joining the webinar after the demonstration. The demonstration was about the gas, the neo-xylem, uh, you know, control system uh, that is uh, 
that need your support so people who are able who are in anywhere and you can act against it uh, let's let it not happen because we really don't want to have more morias we really, we don't want to uh, you know have more numbers of people uh, sinking in the sea uh, people left behind and this need your support and don't forget the refugees are courageous enough themselves to stand in the first line but the only thing that they need is to have, uh, uh, you know, to get this trust, to have this chain of solidarity people, and uh, to get this engagement and this courage to stand and to have your own voices. So you can be that, and you can support the voice of refugees uh, who are in the front line. Thank you very much for listening to this webinar. And um, I really wanted to continue that, but I think it would. Thank you. I, I don't want to say without goodbye. <laughs> and um, and good luck at the demonstration. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And we'll be sending um, all of Parwana's um, con uh, Instagram and her books and how you can keep in, in touch with her in our email tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, Parwana. So have a nice evening and uh, thank you again. Thank you. And that, that feeds perfectly into resilience, which is our final question for the panel. Um, I'm gonna go to James first. Um, when a policymaker says no to a policy amendment request, what's the next step? Just really quick. So in Europe Must Act, we did a lot of um, template letters to councils and MPs. Um, and a lot of the responses, you know, were automatic, no, no. What's the, what's the next step? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Well, I, th I think this is really, really important. Um, key, po key principles of perseverance and resilience are absolutely crucial in this sector, and it's hard. You know, it takes a toll, and you know, I think it's taking a toll on groups like us in the UK and across Europe. You know, given the scale of the challenges that we're facing, that's stating the obvious, but it, it takes its toll. Say, so I'm conscious of time, but three really quick points. Firstly, I'd say that generally it's worth going through a uh, process of discernment in thinking about what particular policy we're trying to change and not going into the trap of necessarily thinking we must push this particular policy or this particular change as the only route because it's rarely the case that a particular policy change or tweak is the key to everything I think you know we all have a vision that's beyond that we're trying to achieve specific things for the people that, that we work with and, and that we represent but you know I think all of us would have a shared very similar shared vision of what Europe should be like in terms of its approach to migration and refugees and that's a big picture thing it goes beyond one particular policy stating the obvious having said that detention action and we have a one one key uh, policy asked which is the end of indefinite detention in in the UK which the only country with no time limit for, for detention and we have been working at that in various different ways over the last 15 years um, over the last few years we turned that into a piece of legislation we took it beyond it's important that it, the, the 28 day time limit is a slogan and, and that it's a widely supported campaign but we've taken that into legislative language work with lawyers to turn that into a realistic proposal which we think uh you know would would try if, if it came into to law and when it comes into law would transform the picture and va picture and vastly reduce people subject to immigration detention so far we've tabled that amendment to several immigration bills all, always under conservative led government so there is a reality about where when it's going whether it's going to get through but we have almost got there um a few years ago um when there was a hung parliament and we have a core faith in in the robustness of that legislation so it's not you know something we keep reviewing but we are going to keep bringing back finally i just say that alongside that perseverance it's important to think about you know whether it's a, one's own organization but also more widely about a variety of approaches i think it's rarely the case that you know just uh, well if anything just grass grass just grass group my activism might sometimes be be the key be enough but in lot but certainly it's rarely the case that just parliamentary work or just strategic litigation or just public or online campaigning we need to think about all the approaches and what's going to work at a particular time hence for example detention action you know working with other groups to bring strategic litigation around rwanda that wasn't something where um there was no legislation or no new legislation supporting that it was something we're going to have to go into get, going to get going to the courts to try and stop in in the short and medium term so it's important to think about different approaches thank you and christian and felix do you have anything you'd like to add when you hear no from policymakers um and question for everybody 
what practical results have you seen that show our activism work is effective? Felix? Um, sorry, I put up my hand quite quickly if anyone else wanted to go, but now I've started, so we'll save time. Um, uh, just very quickly, the um, I think a lot of people will have seen the, the Freedom From Torture campaign about stopping the flight, um, the deportation flights, and they were recognised publicly recently um, with a well-deserved award. And I think <clears throat> for, for the groups I work with and a lot of other people, one thing that opened up a lot is the private interests at the heart of, of, of many of these things, of, of the prison industrial complex, the military industrial complex, whatever it is, you've got to follow the money and remember how many people are profiting off of, um, off of the entire system as it's set up. And in Calais, that's extremely visible. Uh, we think about evictions, which happen every 24 to 36 hours. And you've got to consider that as well as the police, there's uh, waste companies who have quite lucrative deals to remove everybody's personal belongings, often destroy them. Uh, we see barbed wire being erected regularly new drones, new enforcement. There are a lot of private interests and private companies who are going hand in hand with the government to enforce uh, these hostile policies. Um, so activism that targets that is, is obviously effective, can be effective. And like James said, it's another one of many things to have in your toolbox, as well as policy, as well as grassroots activism, as well as communication campaigns to think about businesses and, and corporate interests and how those can be approached. I think that was the only thing I wanted to say there. Cool, thank you. And Christian? Um, yeah, this is, uh, to be honest, not one of my favorite questions. Uh, I get this question very often. On the other hand, it's, it's I think, with regards to um, how can we be better activists, I think this is the question that we have to ask more often, um, because we all know it's very hard to measure, especially if it's political advocacy. Um, of course, researchers who run research projects over three years, they might come with uh, might, might come up with answers on this. Um, for ourselves, I think it's important to look more into this and also um, to have a, like a feedback loop. So we see something is not happening and not 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 working. So let's adjust. Let's let's try to to find different uh, angles uh, to to attack or or. Um, yeah, build narratives against uh, uh, certain strategies. Um, to be more concrete, what what I remember in the last five years was definitely the campaigning um, around the the refugee camps in Greece, um, Moria camp on Lesbos. I think partly, I, I, I'm yeah. As I already said, I cannot say what, what uh, we all cannot really measure this, but I think in bigger parts, the, the outcry across Europe really helped to, to make the scene, to raise the awareness for this. Um, and then also the Frontex, Frontex investigations, um, I would say that was not only um, activists, that was also researchers, that was especially journalists, investigative journalists, but the, the cooperation of these two, uh, these three groups, I think they helped a lot to put pressure on Frontex to make the director leave um, and um, yeah, to slightly make them change their or, or, or add human rights monitoring to their to their strategy is far away from from being perfect or or finish this task. But um, I think this is something where we were effective, and I think we were effective because we worked together. And that, that's my main point here: that we have to build uh, alliances, and 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 we have to make this sharp and crisp and on the point, and not about too many things in the same time, maybe. Um, I know it's easier, uh, very easy to say that, but um, I think this Frontex campaign showed showed that it's possible and um, that we should continue in in a way like that and and build these alliances. Well, thank you, Christian. Also, um, if you haven't seen yet Citizen of Moria, I'd recommend watching that documentary. Um, Europe must acted a few screenings across Europe of it, and it gives a really great picture of. Well, not a great picture, but and it still has some hopeful elements, but um, you know, follows a refugee named Ahmad from Afghanistan and his journey to Moria and um eventually out of Moria, but it is a really comprehensive um look at what happens to asylum seekers on their journeys. And I'm gonna we have one minute left, but if you guys have any questions you'd like to ask each other if anything comes to mind or, and if we get any other questions, we will um, 
add them into our follow-up email, which we'll send tomorrow. And Christian, sorry, I saw your question. Uh, sorry, no, not right now. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I was watching everyone's faces. <laughs> um, would you, uh, how about everybody says one final slogan before we finish? Should I go first? <laughs> no, that would be nice. <laughs> I'm gonna do um, an uh, old. What's the, what's the? It's it's old but faithful. Say it loud. Say it clear. Refugees are welcome here. Should we end with that? <laughs> end with a cliche, but it's true. <laughs> I mean, I could say maybe a, a few words. I'm, I'm very bad in creating slogans in, in, in one minute. Um, <laughs> but what really is, is in my mind these days is um, we all, we activists, we face a situation that was created by politicians and leaders across Europe. And we are here spending our, what is today, Tuesday evening, um, discussing things and discussing how we can explain this horrible and appalling situation where people die in the waters. How can we explain this to people across Europe? Um, and this is, is something which, um, again, I don't have the, the final answer to, but I think we need to find a way to make this more clear and maybe boil it down to this point and say, do you guys actually know what you are doing? <laughs> this is like really put it together in one point. I know we all have the details and we all have this 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 evidence, but we see that it's very often not working. So this is a bit my my point, or maybe also a takeaway for people tonight. How can we make this more clear and use framing and and make this clear to everyone that this is not how we want to live uh, in this world and uh, we don't want people to be treated in the way we treat people right now in the borders across Europe. I think that's perfect. Thank you, Christian. And thank you, James and Felix for for logging in with us tonight. And thank you everyone for who's joined who's joined us today. Um, just looking if there are any more questions. I think we're good. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. It's been recorded. If you'd like to watch it again or share it with your friends, please do. And uh, we'll be sending an email tomorrow, as I mentioned, with our panelists' information and answers to a few more questions. And thank you so much and have a good rest of your evening. Bye, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks all.